A significant event in the life of Mike Bickle's new church in Kansas City began to take place because of what he said God had spoken to him during a prophetic encounter on April 13, 1983. Mike was praying and meditating on Daniel 9 during the evening prayer meeting when suddenly he heard the audible voice of God, which he knew to be an angel communicating God's message to him. He said to Mike, Call the people together for a solemn assembly. Call the people together to fast and pray for twenty-one days, and the Lord will pour forth His glory and His strength. As this was exploding in his spirit, a woman went to the microphone and started prophesying and praying some of the exact same things that were being spoken to him in his spirit at that moment. She made declarations about His glory and His strength. The angel continued to speak to Mike that night saying, there will be five hundred people in this city that will stand as a corporate Daniel. Just as the promises of God were released for Israel in Daniel's day through prayer and fasting, so God wants to release this nation from its bondage in the same way. I'm going to raise up a corporate Daniel from this city for this nation. The time of fasting and prayer and seeking my face will be the beginning of my purpose in this nation in a new dimension. This was clearly a difficult word for Mike to announce publicly. His brother Pat Bickle was supportive of what he felt the Lord was telling him to do, but encouraged him to have the word confirmed before he proclaimed it. Needing a confirmation, Mike called Bob Jones the next morning. Mike was careful not to say one word about the content of what the Lord had revealed to him. The only way he could be absolutely certain that he had heard God correctly was to obtain a second witness in a way that could not be controlled or manipulated by man. Bob agreed to see Mike and told him on the phone, without Mike saying anything specific about his prophetic encounter, that he had already seen an angel the night before and knew what was on Mike's heart. Bob even joked and kidded with Mike and said, I know what you need to know, and invited Mike to come over. Feeling the gravity and the intensity of the moment, Mike started to leave, then turned around and went looking for some witnesses for the conversation that would soon take place. He saw Brad Chick playing his guitar in the sanctuary, and his friend Chris Burge hanging out with him. Suddenly Mike burst into the room very excited and said, I need two witnesses and I need to go right now. He looked intensely at Brad and Chris and said, You two come with me. Brad asked, Where are we going? We've got to go see Bob Jones, Mike replied. Chris was excited and said, Oh, this is going to be great. Mike was obviously nervous and excited and this carried over to Brad and Chris as they got in Mike's beat-up Nissan and started racing towards Bob's house, driving east then north on I-435 towards Independence at 80 miles an hour. On the way to Bob's house, Mike said, Listen carefully. Then he explained to them that the Lord had directly spoken to him about Daniel chapter 9, and how God wanted his church, and those who would embrace it, to be like a corporate Daniel of fasting and prayer to affect his purposes for this nation. He shared with them how Bob Jones had said he had the answer for Mike concerning his experience and God's purposes in this nation the previous night. Chris sat in the back seat and just soaked it in. He found this overwhelming and asked Mike a question about Bob. He actually saw an angel. But Mike didn't want advice. He just needed two witnesses when he got to Bob's house. When they arrived, Bob was smiling and started to kid around with Mike, but eventually said, I saw him. Mike asked, Who? Bob replied, the angel Gabriel visited me for the second time in my life last night, and told me to tell you, give the young man Daniel chapter 9, and he will understand. Mike's jaw dropped and he thought, this is amazing. Brad and Chris were awestruck, and they thought, this is mind-blowing. Bob proceeded to explain that God had called this fast and sent the angel Gabriel to Mike to proclaim a 21-day period of prayer and fasting, and that 500 people would respond. Bob proclaimed, it will be significant in the spiritual life of Kansas City. Hack Bickle just loved the idea of the solemn assembly. We were reaching out and God was listening, and things were going to start happening. He really believed that he was going to be healed, and this would be the start of the whole thing. Mike announced the solemn assembly to his church, South Kansas City Fellowship, on Sunday, April the 17th. Bob Scott spoke at the beginning of the service, and then Mike spoke out of Isaiah 30. He shared with the congregation that the Lord had spoken to him in a very serious and solemn way. He believed that the Lord was speaking to the group, that he was waiting to have compassion on us, and that he would be gracious to us when he heard the cries from our hearts. 
Then Mike took his congregation through Luke, chapters 1 to 2. He described the different responses of people that the Lord dealt with around the time of Jesus' conception. He explained how Mary had responded in faith and obedience, even though the word given to her was hard to accept. Zacharias had doubted the word, because his education had caused his childlike faith to disappear. Mike spoke about others the Lord had spoken to as well in the Bible, like Simeon and Anna, who were waiting patiently for the move of God in their day. Then Mike spoke about a sword coming down, and that God wanted to remove the pure from the impure, and the need for people to be willing to pay a price. We should not allow ourselves to be at ease in Zion. His message went on for around 45 minutes. He then went into Daniel chapter 9, and how the Lord had spoken to him about a 21-day fast to cry out for God's purposes in the city, and how the Lord had confirmed the word to him. He shared how the Lord would release this city from bondage if God's people would respond to a 21-day fast and cry out for His mercy. Most people in the congregation rallied at once. In fact, many were enthusiastic and just jumped up and cheered. They were overjoyed at the thought of extravagantly seeking the Lord like this. Mike's charisma and energy gave him the ability to make this future event sound rather exciting and even cool, but deep down Mike knew it could be a very difficult task. Dan Gilliland, a young man who was visiting for the first time, was overwhelmed and decided to make SKCF his new church home, because this was what the Lord had put in his heart. Sharon Riley, who came to find out if Mike's church was of the Lord or not, showed up that morning. When Mike boldly stood up and said, None of you are here by accident today, and then presented the message that was it for her, and she became a member. Another young man, Marlon Willingham, first became aware of the church through a friend of his, Brian Larson. This was his first service. Through listening to this Blow the Trumpet in Zion message, in which Mike announced the solemn assembly, Marlon felt from that moment on, his future and destiny, was going to be involved in and linked with SKCF. Jeff Earle, who was studying to be a doctor, was excited at the idea of participating in the fast at first, but also a little disappointed, because he was not going to be at much of it, due to his attending medical school. But then he was blessed to find out that he was able to take off the first week of his final year, so the Lord opened the way for him to participate. Kathy Ryan found fasting easy, even though she worked in a restaurant. She was truly impacted by the hope of revival, and that God wanted more for His people. What Kathy was experiencing was very real to her as she realized that it matters if you pray. God has something for us, she thought. We must live holy lives and say yes to the invitation. For Terry Taylor this was very exciting, and it was a major deal. This was the first time she was going to fast beyond just one day. For the new believers Kirby and Lorley Peterman, this was just another example of routine Christianity that they were learning about, and they accepted the call without reservation. But that morning the Holy Spirit woke up Leland May, who had received many recent prophetic encounters, and said to him audibly, you need to go to South Kansas City Fellowship. When he listened to Mike that morning, he was moved but convinced that God spoke to him that revival was not going to happen immediately after the solemn assembly. So he enjoyed the message but didn't fast, because of the word of knowledge. Others, who'd been attending up until this time, left, with talk of the angel Gabriel and a corporate Daniel 21-day fast. It all seemed too far-fetched. An old friend of Mike's from Colonial, Don Stedman, a senior executive with the Kansas City Chiefs and Jack Stedman's son, who had been attending for about four weeks, were among those who left. He felt that this fellowship was a little bit too militant for him at this point. A young man named Greg Clinton heard Mike's message proclaimed on the radio and got his tape, Blow the Trumpet in Zion, but when he took it to his elders at the Baptist church that he was attending, he was discouraged from participating. Mike called up Kip Hunra, who was going to the University of Kansas in Lawrence, and told him about the angel Gabriel and the 21-day fast, then told him to tell all his friends. He and his future wife made up some flyers and passed them out around the campus. The timing for them was perfect because they graduated on May 7th and could drive right to the solemn assembly. Jerry Reardon around this time was starting to get acquainted with Bob Jones, Augustine, and Gary Crows. Jerry was excited about the solemn assembly and sent a letter announcing it to the Bishop of Kansas City and to all the Catholic churches in the area. 
He also encouraged his Catholic friends to get involved. Promotion was a big task, but day and night Patricia King, the bookstore lady, was typing on an electric typewriter over and over, blow the trumpet in Zion. People would line up to get those tapes, and they were mailed all over the world. Chris Burge, with his brother Jeff, drove throughout the area within a 30-mile radius, going to local churches, hitting about 60 or 70 overall, telling them about the message of prayer to those who would listen. If they were not really interested, the tape was left at the church in a public place for people to hear. Tim Johns and Mike Bickle reconnected at this time, when they saw each other at a pastor's conference. Mike told Tim, I'm going to start this solemn assembly of 21 days of prayer and fasting for revival in the city. Tim said, Mike, I'm all in. The solemn assembly idea really clicked with Steve Moore, who was anxious to begin a time of fasting according to what God had already spoken to him personally in the fall. This was going to be exciting for Steve, because his first fast was with only two brothers, but now he had a whole church load of people who were going on this fast too. It was just another sign that he was going in the right direction. A few days later, two weeks before the beginning of the solemn assembly, Steve said to the Lord, I want to start this thing early because I want to be in the flow of this stuff to help things along from the very beginning. So he started fasting on his own. On the third day, he said he was driving down the road in his Volkswagen when suddenly waves of power started to come over him. He fasted from then through the entire solemn assembly and beyond it. His fast lasted well over a month. He believed that he had received an impartation of grace in his car that day for this extended fast. One of Mike's tapes found its way to St. Louis and into the hands of Tom Bockhaus after Marla Wessel sent it with a very convicting letter. He decided to move to Kansas City and gave it to a friend of his, Michelle Keller. She realized that this was always what she had wanted, but the question for her was, how do we get this? Mike wanted the fast to be open to all the pastors in the metro area of Kansas City. So he wrote a letter inviting all of them and their churches to participate and announced his fast in the Kansas City Star. The responses were mixed. Some of the pastors involved themselves and their churches, while others criticized it and thought it was presumptuous. Some of the different churches in the area that responded favorably to the announcement and participated included Covenant Love Fellowship, the Argentine Mennonite Church, and the Milk and Honey Church. At Colonial Presbyterian Church, where Mike used to attend, Pastor Ted Nissen read the proclamation letter to his congregation on a Sunday morning and said, Wouldn't it be nice if this really is God's plan? Lynn Barrow and his wife Carol were in the audience and decided they were going to be involved. There were other pastors around the city who decided to come and participate, but others didn't really have it in their hearts, and some simply ignored it or eventually pushed back against it. Several churches from Ale decided to participate. When Mike called the solemn assembly, Wes Adams, a fellow quad like Pat and Larry Fry, were two leaders of seven churches that participated. For Wes Adams and many others, it seemed like heaven was proclaiming that a very significant landmark event was about to take place. Mike decided to begin the solemn assembly on May the 7th. Before and at the beginning of it, he taught and passed out handouts on intercession for everyone to have and study. He gave people many verses on prayer and intercession from the books of Isaiah through Malachi and the intercessory prayers in the New Testament. Mike, along with Bob Jones, were making very concrete statements about how spiritual breakthroughs were going to happen in the near future. Something big was just right around the corner. People's expectations were growing and became very high. They started living every moment with this sense of expectation that something big was going to happen at any moment, and it was getting overly intense. Ten days before the beginning of the fast, Mike preached on Acts 3.21 and times of restoration of all things. He encouraged people to fill their hearts with scriptures related to the coming move of God that he sincerely believed was going to come right after the fast. He was simply in love with the people of his church and communicated that to them. He encouraged everyone to read the scriptures with the eyes of a child and not make the mistake of the Pharisees who had read the scriptures but missed the move of God because they did not read it with humility. Mike spoke very clearly on the value of humility, and that the Lord was only going to teach those that were humble. He would withhold from those who knew too much and were arrogant. 
Mike encouraged everyone to get on their knees to pray, fast and study the Word with a prayerful attitude, and admit one's inability to learn without the anointing and grace of God. In the background Bob Jones was always saying amen to all that Mike was saying. And so it began. Nearly 1,000 people from all over Kansas City participated in Mike Bickle's solemn assembly. Every day for almost three weeks, they would gather at the Fox Hill office building to pray from 6 a.m. to midnight on the microphone, with a normal time of worship between 7 to 8 every night. During the day there were usually 200 people praying. During the evenings the number increased to 500, and the meetings ended at midnight.